A police report finally made sense of my childhood memories. My mother and I used to live together in a large house on the crest of a hill. We had a sitting room that overlooked the churchyard, cemetery, a short way down the road. I rarely went into that room as a child because that's where my mother kept most of the faceless dolls. Later, I learned they're called shy kids, or hide-and-seek dolls. They're life-size, they're posed with their hands clasped in front of them. They can be propped up in corners or against walls, and it... Well, it looks like a child is covering their eyes as they sulk and time out, or as they count to ten as part of a hiding game. They're designed to face the wall, and so the front side is usually unfinished and doesn't look like a person at all. As an eight-year-old, I was creeped out by their limpness and how they slowly slumped down if mom didn't readjust them every few days. I, I didn't like how their poses always seemed to involve hiding, being upset, to justify how they always stood with their backs turned to the room. And most of all, I remember how traumatizing it was the first time I inspected one of them to find nothing except a lumpy and threadbare bag of nylon where the child's face should be cotton-like fiber fill that stuffed the doll to give it its shape, poked out through the nylon exterior in places, and my imagination took over. I saw a face that was screaming in terror, with a pair of two small eyes and a jagged, irregular mouth near the doll's chin. Mom kept about twelve of these dolls in the room overlooking the cemetery. She had maybe another dozen of them scattered all around the house. There was at least one in every room, including my bedroom, and they all had names. There was a Mary, Constance, an Abigail, an Adam, a Jeremiah, and many others that I no longer remember. Mom called the one in my bedroom Peter, and forbade me to move him. He's your brother, she would scold me, with real fury in her eyes. You both share this bedroom. The police came to arrest my mom one day. And I went to live with my grandmother, who I called Nana. I didn't see mom after that, and Nana always refused to talk about her. We lived that way for five years. Around the time I turned 13, she let slip that mama was being... being let out soon. I managed to press my grandmother for the first hints of what really happened. Your mother lost her mind when Peter died, she said hesitantly. Until then, I had no idea that Peter was even an actual person. She had you two years later, but lost her firstborn son in a drowning like that. Then I lost her composure for a few seconds. She never recovered, she said. That's why she collected the dolls, I said in astonishment. But why was she arrested? Nana shook her head. Took a deep breath. She's getting mixed up about what was real and what was pretend. She did something bad. And she's been in a mental hospital for the past five years. She'll be let out soon, though. My grandmother tried to look brave, but couldn't quite manage it. I'm hoping she feels a lot better when we see her again. Nana drove me to visit Mom, but didn't want to stay herself. I'm sorry, she told me as the car idled in Mom's driveway. I just can't face her. Call me as soon as you're ready to be picked up, or if anything seems weird. I will, I said. Mom was excited to see me when I walked into the door, but not, not quite in the way I expected. She seemed gaunt and wild, crazier than I imagined she could ever look. I remembered our well-kept childhood home, but her new apartment was messy and barely furnished at all. She called me by name and hugged me and then asked, Did you bring your change of clothes? Yeah, I nodded and indicated the backpack that I was carrying. Mom had been adamant on the phone that I bring something to change into. I thought she just didn't want me wearing dirty clothes if I stayed over through tomorrow, but... But I was wrong. Good, she exclaimed. 
I've been waiting so long to show you this. She led me toward the back of the apartment until I saw something that made my heart skip. In the corner of the bedroom was an undressed, shy kid figure. One that was as tall as I was. It stood with its forehead resting against the wall with both hands in its pockets. Did you make this? I asked hesitantly. I had to, she beat. You've grown so much, I couldn't buy one this big, and even had to ask Nana for your height. It... It... It's me. It's you, she affirmed happily. Now change out of your clothes so we can dress you. I realized abruptly that Mom was referring to both me and the doll as... you. We were two iterations of the same person in her mind. I don't want to give the doll my clothes, Mom, I said. I could feel my voice shaking as her face changed from brightly excited to furious. Do you know how hard it was for me to keep Peter's old shirt and pants while I was in the hospital? And I had to let them take everything else away. She marched suddenly out of the room and I followed her timidly. As I turned the corner to find her, I saw that she was pulling a hunting rifle out of the hallway closet. You're not supposed to have that, Mom, I whispered. I suddenly felt very sure that I was going to die. She didn't answer because she was entirely fixated on loading the rifle. Hands were trembling, and she fumbled while she did so. It was then that I, I pushed past her and I made for the door. How dare you, she shrieked. I could hear her footsteps following me. I remembered my backpack full of spare clothes, and I threw it down before running out of the apartment. Keep the clothes, I screamed, and I slammed the door shut behind me. I kept running, but Mom never... She never opened the door to pursue me. Maybe the backpack was all she really wanted. I got home as quickly as I could. I, I jogged and then slowed to a walk when the stitch in my side became too painful. It took me over an hour to make it back home to Nana's house without a car. We called the cops as soon as I told her what had happened, and and I, I haven't heard from my mother since that night. Nana never talked about it. And I was, I was honestly afraid to ask her. Nana died when I was 17. I got myself emancipated as an adult because there was there was no one left in my life to take me in. After my grandmother's funeral, I decided to find out what really happened once and for all. The criminal records told me everything I needed to know. The cops couldn't find mom at first. When I fled and I hurried home after she brandished the rifle and demanded my clothes, mom was alone for about an hour and a half before anyone came for her. In that time, she must have hastily constructed her own faceless doll. And there were pictures of the apartment as it appeared when the police first arrived. The house was empty except for three faceless dolls, seated around the kitchen table. Mom's doll was roughly humanoid, with stuffed pantyhose for skin and wearing Mom's best outfit. It was posed to be slumped over at the kitchen table as though collapsing in a sobbing fit and burying its head in its hands. Also seated at the table were two smaller dolls, positioned similarly, with their heads down. One was a teenage size one that represented me, and the other looked like a child. One I'm sure was meant to be Peter. They found her in her underwear, crushed to death in a garbage truck's trash compactor. I think Mom climbed into a relatively empty dumpster and waited to die. Now that her family's dolls were perfect without her, she just... She just threw herself away. I went back into the old records of Mom's criminality. It gets so much worse. The charges from her first arrest read as follows. Interfering with a burial ground. 
desecrating a corpse, an attempted abduction. Mom had been going to the cemetery and digging up bodies to dress her dolls. Among her targets were long dead children named Mary and Constance, Abigail, Adam, and Jeremiah. I can sometimes see the doll outfits in my mind and how anachronistic they often were. It all finally made sense. The police finally caught on when Mom graduated from simple grave robbing. She apparently tried to lure a girl named Ruth into her car. And that's when Mom went away for the first time. I always loved my mother. But I, I can't forgive her. To this day, whenever I see a human form facing away from me, there's always a split second of wondering how horrible the things I can't see might turn out to be. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and thank you for watching tonight's video or listening to tonight's podcast, and thank you for clicking the thumbs up, the subscribe, the follow, the bell, the whatever uh, helpful thing there is on such a platform. If you want to find your nice Halloween horror audiobook to listen to this year, check out audible.com and look for Mr. Creepypasta, because I got a whole bunch of books over there. Books like Tales from the Gas Station. And as always, I want to give a very big thank you to everybody who is supporting me on Patreon. If you guys have been supporting me on Patreon, or if you're considering doing so, then know that I just added in a couple of cool things for the loyalty program because I found out that I could. I had no idea that I could do that. So now, <laughs> you guys should be getting some cool things in the mail brought to you by Patreon that are pretty cool. They support the channel as well. Oh, getting to the point though, a huge thank you to patrons such as Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Brian Ars, Bobby Carmen, Stephanie Butler, Tristan Pelton, Chance Burnett, Diana Krause, William King, Heather McDonald, Reaper61167, Alex the Sandwich, Darth Myver, Michael Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Ness69420, Isodo Hatred, with two exclamation points, Nessie, Ronnie Hansen, Bartohawk764, Melancholy Corpse, Ferb, Harley, Billy Morrow, Madam Skull Bunny, Sashi Suzaku, Grizzly Olsen Dut Pro, Caden the Spooky Boy, Zane Nightshade, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Ashwood, Lord of the Weebs, Jay, Miss Xandra, Mr. Unsettling Spaghetti, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Fried Chicken 12, Freddy Krueger, Pie Nanny, Michael Scarborough, Infernal One, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Jordan Nels, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kira the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Guy Harbor, Nina Smith, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin. Thank you guys so much, so, so much, so, so, so much for being a part of the Patreon and helping me keep the lights on and helping me get exclusive stories and everything that we do on the channel here. Thank you guys so, so much for being a part of it. Thank everybody in the description and thank you guys who have stayed to this part of the video. It really means so much to me. I hope you all have a very happy Halloween and sweet dreams. <laughs>